I grew up in Treasure County near the town of Hysham on a farm which was on one of the upper benches of the current Yellowstone River Valley. And so I've been picking up agates pretty much my whole life. Um, yeah. It's always been a thing as far back as I can remember to pick up agates. And one of the things to look for in agates is this white skin. It's very bright white like this example here on this side and sometimes it's sort of a dull white like on this side um, so that's one of the things to look for in an agate but an agate can be very just a dark black rock look like a dark black rock but it'll have this white skin on it and then you know the inside will look beautiful a couple other things to look for in agates are um, these dented patterns or divots and also on the other side of this agate is the betroidal um, nature that the inside of the cavity might develop and betroidal um, surfaces developed by the nature of how the agate grows. Um, and this is the rock from which one of the samples in the calendar came from. And this is another pattern that I look for when I'm looking for agates. And this I've heard described as the agate skin. And you get these really small conchoidal fractures on the outside of an agate. As it's being tumbled down the river, it just bangs against other rocks and has these tiny fractures all over the surface of the rock. And this just looks like a black rock. But this one was also on the backside of the calendar and you turn it over and you've got this big uh, druzy quartz crystal pocket and um, agate banding all the way around um, that druzy quartz pocket. And so this is about uh, almost 11 and a half pound agate, um, a very nice big agate. But if you just saw this, you wouldn't think it was an agate, um, but it is. Another silicified rock that you find in the Ellison River gravels is um, petrified wood. If you're really lucky, you can find a, a piece of petrified wood that looks like this. And this I thought was an agate when I first saw it because it had the, the conchoidal fractures on the outside and the agate skin. But when I started looking at it, I, I noticed that it was had wood grain in it. And so this chunk of wood has almost been completely replaced by um, silica and silicon oxygen so it's this translucent um, it's it's truly translucent piece of wood and it's just so heavily they call this agatized but it's really a replacement it's not the same process as forming an agate it's a replacement of organic material with the silicon and the oxygen so you can find um, Montana moss agates anywhere uh, the Yellowstone River is now or has been in the past and that's a large swath of eastern, eastern Montana. Um, most people find agates on the river um, and that's a good place to find agates on the river because every flood cycle turns over new rocks and so after every spring flood you've got new material potentially to find even if you've been to a certain gravel bar before um, you know you could turn up new new rock um, and so that's one that's probably the most common place people search for yellowstone agates and then um, but they're also and where i found most of mine because i grew up on a gravel bench is the gravel benches anywhere above the river in eastern montana along the yellowstone uh, you can find um, Montana moss agates and these like this moss ag or this agate um, which is sort of a waterline agate but it's also a moss agate um, I found about 20 miles more than 20 miles south of the river and about a thousand feet above the river in elevation and so anywhere these historic river anywhere the historic Yellowstone River went you you potentially have moss agates that you can find in these gravels and so you can find them in a lot of places. This one that I sliced that um, became part of the calendar I found in a gravel road. Um, so I found that in a road and all I could see was just part of the betroidal part of the agate um, sticking out in the road and I dug it up and it became a bigger agate than I thought it was. So yes, you can find these agates all over Eastern Montana. 
An agate is a form of chalcedony, and uh, there are many forms of chalcedony. There's jasper, uh, chert, flint are all forms of chalcedony. And chalcedony forms um, by stacking very tiny crystals of quartz. And so these are quartz crystals, these, these little macroscopic quartz crystals because you can see them with your eye. And chalcedony is stacked quartz crystals, stacked this way, and they form very long chains of stacked crystals that twist in a helix manner. A thousand of these tiny quartz crystals that make up chalcedony are the width of one human hair. An agate, on the other hand, is when chalcedony has banding. Um, you can see the banding along the bottom of this rock. And this agate also has the moss, what's distinctive of Montana moss agates. And there are other agates that do have moss, um, but that's one of the things about Montana moss agates and where they get their name is the moss. Um, this is another agate, Montana agate, um, and you can see the banding filling the cavity. And so um, agates form in cavities in rock, and most likely this was a former bubble that was in a magma that got trapped when that magma solidified, and then water laden with silica filled this cavity and precipitated out the the agate. Quite often you'll you'll have macroscopic crystals of quartz filling the interior of the agate. And that's because as you're precipitating out the silica material from the water, it gets less and less concentrated and when it's less concentrated you form the bigger crystals. I started to realize, wow, you know, this is I don't have a market for it, but it, this is neat. So I put them, started putting them in buckets. And uh, after about 20 years, I had uh, about two ton of them buckets. <laughs> well, then as I began to learn more about the crystal structures and the other structures, and uh, other people began seeing the beauty in that, then I woke up to the fact that hey we shouldn't be crushing these right? little pieces for we should be doing something with them so that's that was the reason for the third book mm -hmm. the many faces of montana agate and um, so the the whole idea is to uh, try to get the best out of the agate mm -hmm and show its best face forward. Uh, find some that I'm interested in that need to be sawn open. Uh, then I'll bring them in here and uh, whatever saw it fits into. And if, um, if I have a bunch to do, you can handle four or five saws. Wouldn't you want to uh, make a cabochon or a carving or just uh shape the face of a stone to, to polish. It takes the machines like this with diamond wheels in order to shape and and you gotta go through a process of sanding finer and finer finer finally onto a, a buff like that middle one with the polish on it and that brings it up to the okay. final polish. Now this is my coarse grinder. I use this when I'm carving some of the unusual stuff because this is a, called a centered wheel. It's got diamond for about a quarter of an inch there. Mm -hmm. So I did, I've cut many, many, many carvings on this. I can use the corners and mm -hmm. on then you, some of the work that I grew and shaped you have to have the curved wheels and I can spin these wheels onto that machine uh, it, when I'm in the process of carving something. Try to take out the flaws and, and uh, go with the structure of right. the stone. Right. I try to do, uh, use the big, big wheels as long as you can and then you 
you have to go in and get into the crevices, you do this long. Ten long hours there. This is the big sky, I guess I call it. This rock weighed right at 11 pounds. This was all crust. Mm -hmm. You couldn't see. And I had a brand new grinding setup. And one New Year's, I needed something to do, and I grabbed that rock and I started grinding the crust off. Mm -hmm. Well, when I did, these started to be exposed, and I ended up grinding a pound and a half of rock off to expose this six by nine inch face, you know. Above Savage on the river, I was walking down a kind of a bank, picking the gravel that was exposed, and I picked up this piece of agate, and and it looked pretty solid, kind of was thin here. I actually ground the hole out, but it was, and then uh, about 50 feet down further, I found this little piece of agate. And I thought, oh yeah, well, the keeper of the flame. <laughs> One of the things that makes Montana moss agates special to me anyway, is that they have um, dendrites. You know, most agates that you find around the world will have the banding, but Montana moss agates have um, also have dendrites commonly associated with them. And, and the dendrites are just little growths of manganese oxide that happened within the chalcedony. And the chalcedony is very porous, and I'm not exactly sure how the dendrites get in there, um, but it's growths of, of manganese oxide or iron oxides in, in the chalcedony. Another um, special feature that you can find in some Montana moss agates, probably around one or two percent of them, will have iris banding. And iris banding is refraction of light through the, through the agate itself. And so the agate is made up of these crypto-crystalline layers of of those tiny little quartz crystals. And sometimes you'll have other material that's also silicon and oxygen, but it's a slightly different mineral and it's called melganite. And when you get layers of quartz and melganite together, stacked together, um, they have different um, refractive indices. So they will refract light at a different angle. And so that way you can get this rainbow iris effect in some Montana moss agates. So there are lots of different kinds of rocks you can find in the Yellowstone River gravels. These gravels, along with the agates that you can find, these gravels are um, largely accessible to the public. Um, you can get on the Yellowstone River at bridges and at um, public access sites all along the river and once you're on the river you can float or walk anywhere below the high water line um, to wander the river looking for agates and um, jasper and various chalcedonies and lots of petrified wood.